Hi guys, welcome to 11.2 Infinite Series. Last section in 11.1, we talked about infinite sequences. Well, a series is just taking the terms of those sequence and adding them together. So a series is the sum of the terms of an infinite sequence. So the sequence is the actual list of terms. So here is an example of a sequence. Okay. So the corresponding series would be would be one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus forever. The notation that we use will in math. The Greek letter sigma is used for sum. So this is the sequence here. I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to write it in its condensed form. This is the sequence 1 over 2n. n equals 1 to infinity. So we use the brackets when we want to list the elements and look at it as a sequence. When we look at it as a sum, we're going to take that same notation, that same explicit formula. We're going to put it here. And we start at 1 and we go to infinity. Remembering that this, anytime you see this capital sigma in math, it means sum. So this says, start by plugging in one, so we get one over two to the one, and then this says add to that, one over two squared, one over two cubed, and all the way up to infinity. So note something super cool. This sum, this infinite collection of positive numbers actually has a finite value. It's one. If we were to do this forever, it would add up to one. You might say, well, how is that possible? How can an infinite collection of positive numbers all add up to one? Well, let me just give you a, a brief geometric view on this. Let's suppose we have a square and the length of the square, each side is one unit. All right, and let's take half of that square and let's look at the area. All right, you agree that this is one half. So that represents the first term in the sequence. I'm going to take what's remaining, which is one quarter of the square, and I'm going to add that. So one half plus one quarter is three quarters of the entire square. I'm going to take what's remaining of that three, uh, three quarter, take out the three quarters, the remaining is one quarter. I'm going to cut that in half. And when I cut that in half, that gives me the next term, one eighth. So it represents that term in the sequence. And we continue like this. I take half of that. That's going to be 1 16th. Right, so if we do this infinitely, right, can you see how we will technically never fill it in, but it will converge to 1. It will almost fill in. So I think that's kind of pretty cool. All right, let's look at another example. Let's look at the harmonic sequence, one, one-half, one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth, right? This corresponds to, this is in condensed form, one over n, n equals one to infinity, right? So this is the sequence. The corresponding series Would be one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth forever, right? And we write this in sequence uh, series notation. N equals one to infinity, so sigma means sum, one over n. Right, so that doesn't look much different than the previous example, but if we add up these numbers infinitely, the sum is infinity. So how can that be? proof. Well, let's look at the graph of f of x equals 1 over x. Right? And let's look at the area from 1 to infinity. So we're backpedaling to chapter 7. So note, we integrate 1 over x from 1 to infinity. It equals infinity. It diverges. 
Okay, we covered that back in 7.8. Right, so do you agree that this area, or hopefully you agree, this area, this yellow area is infinite? Right now, let's consider these little boxes I'm going to draw. Let's go up, let's look at the left sum. Right, so I'm gonna go up the left side. I'm gonna go up the left side here. I'm gonna go up the left side. And let's look at this. All right, so I'm gonna do this and I do this forever. All right, so the area of this first box is, well, this is the curve one over X. So if we go up this area, this has a width one and height one. So this is, has area one. Width one, height one half. This guy has area one half. This guy has area one third. Now we're looking at the rectangles. This has area one fourth, this has area one fifth, so forth and so on. Which is just, if we sum up the area of those rectangles, it is just the sum of the harmonic sequence. So notice one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth forever is greater than the yellow area under the curve, which is, I'll do it, I'll write this, one over x, f, uh, dx, wow. Sorry. And we know that this is infinity. So this is actually a bigger infinity. And yes, infinity has different sizes. We say, the series diverges to infinity. Right, so our goal for the rest of chapter 11 is to work with series and determine if they converge or diverge. So let's look at some of the formalities. Given a series, Sigma n equals one to infinity, which means a one plus a two plus a plus a three um, plus a four forever. We call, ready for this, Sn, which is the sum of the first n terms. So S one would just be a one, S two would be a two, so forth and so on. The nth partial sum. of the series a n. So given the series a n, which is a one plus a two plus a three forever, s one is just the first term. So s the first partial sum is just the actual first term. The second partial sum is the sum of the first two terms. The third partial sum is the sum of the first three terms. And we do this forever. Now note, we now have a sequence in itself. And depending on how this sequence of partial sums behaves, it determines whether or not the series from which that partial, the sequence of partial sums comes from, converges or diverges. So we look at these partial sums if the partial sums converge to a finite number, then the series from which it comes from is also convergent. And we write that the sum of the series is equal to the limit of the partial sums. If the limit of the partial sums diverges, then the corresponding series also diverges. Now using partial sums can be tricky. So let's look at the example. We already, I already looked at it geometrically and hopefully convinced you that the series one over two to the n power converged to one. But if we look at this in terms of partial sums, so this is, I'll write it down, it's one. Um, half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth forever. 
we look at the first partial sum, it's just one half. The second partial sum is one half plus one fourth, which is three fourths. The third partial sum would be the sum of the first three terms. And if you add those up, that's seven eighths. The fourth partial sum. So what we're trying to do is get an idea of how these partial sums behave. One half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth is 15 sixteenths. Do you see a pattern yet? What do you think the fifth partial sum would be? Well, one is one over two, two is three over four, three is seven over eight, four is 15 over 16. So notice that the denominator is just two to that power of the term that it is. And the numerator is just one less than that. So what do I mean? Well, to four to, four to, uh, two to the fourth power is 16, three, two to the three power is eight, two to the two power is four, two to the one power is two. So that's how I get the denominator. So this is gonna be um, two to the fifth power. And the numerator is just one less than that, two to the fifth minus one. Right, so that's going to be uh, 31 over 32. And I, I challenge you to do one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus one thirty second. As to the sixth power is going to be, well, it's going to be two to the sixth on the bottom, which is 64, 63. In general, the nth term is two to the n minus one all over two to the n. Now notice the limit of these partial sums is n goes to infinity, which would be the limit is n goes to infinity. So all your limits from calc two, uh, calc one are coming back to the end. Right. So we can use our rules, our algebra rules. This is just two to the n over two to the n minus one over two to the n which is the limit as n goes to infinity. And this is gonna be one minus one over two to the n. But as n goes to infinity, this goes to zero. So this limit is one. So the limit of the partial sums for the series one over two to the n is one. So therefore we conclude that the infinite sum one over two to the n, n equals one to infinity is one. Woohoo! All right, let's check another one because these were really fun. All right, let's look at this simple series, negative one to the n power. Well, negative one to the n power is looking at, well, if n is one, it's negative one. If n is two, it's positive one. If n is three, it's negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, forever. So my first partial sum would be negative one. My second partial sum would be negative one plus one, which is zero. My third partial sum would be negative one plus one minus one, which is negative one. My fourth partial sum would be negative one plus one minus one plus one, which is zero. So notice these rock back and forth. They rock back and forth between negative one and zero. So the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn does not exist. It does not converge on anything. It literally just bounces back and forth like this forever. It never zooms in on anything. It doesn't do that. So therefore, we would say that the series negative one to the nth power diverges because its sequence of partial sums diverges. Let's, let's revisit seven point, uh, 11 point one geometric sequences. We can look at geometric sequences. We can use two different templates. We can use a r to the n or use a r to the n minus one. We're gonna start looking at this one for the sake of this section. So for example, um, here let's put where, where r 
is the common ratio. Okay, so let's look at 2, 4, 8, 16. The common ratio is 2. Okay. We can write this as, we can write it as, let's see, we can do 2 to the n, right? n equals 1 to infinity, or we can write it as 2 times 2 to the n minus 1, n equals 1 to infinity. If you notice, they're the same thing. If we start with 1 here, we get 2 to the 1, which is the first term. 2 would be 2 squared, which is 4. If we start down here with n equals 1, we get 2 times 2 to the 0, which would be 1 and would start with 2. All right, let's look at this guy. Our, my common ratio is, well, 1, 1 third, 1 ninth, 1 27th. Well, in order to get from the first term to the second, the second to the third, we can see that we multiply by 1 third each time. All right, so we can call this. Well, be careful here because it's not just 1 third to the n power. Because here, if n was 1, we stuck in 1, 1 third would be our first term. So here we have to compensate by sticking a 3 in. Right. So if n was 1, it would be 1 third to the 1 times 3, it would give me the 1. Okay. Or we could write this as, we could write as 1 third, how about this, to the n minus 1, n equals 1 to infinity. All right. So now if we stuck in 1, let's start with 1 third to the 0 power, which would be 1. If we stuck in two, we'd get one third to the first power, right? So just make sure that you can see the connection between these two and we can go back and forth between those. So today, so last class we talked about what a geometric sequence was. Today we're gonna to talk about a geometric series, which is the sum of a geometric sequence. So for example, let's look at this guy right here n equals 1 to infinity, 2 to the n would be 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 forever. And as you can imagine, this sum would be infinite because we're adding bigger and bigger number each time. These are growing without bound. Let's look at this guy. 4 times 1 third to the n minus 1 power. Well, if n is 1, this becomes 0. The power becomes 0. That just becomes 1, so this would be 4 plus. If n is 2, it would be 4 thirds. If n is 3, it would be 4 ninths plus 4 twenty sevenths. So does this converge or diverge? Are these numbers getting small enough, quick enough, that we can say that this has a finite value? Let's see, we know my first partial sum is just four. My second is four plus four thirds, whatever that is. My third is four plus four thirds plus four ninths. Right? And we would continue like this. And our question is, does SN converge to anything? Well, before we go and look at these values, Let's see if we can generalize this. What's really super important, first of all, is just to make sure that you distinguish between the harmonic series and a geometric series. The harmonic series is one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth, right? And this is infinite. So the harmonic series comes from the harmonic sequence. It's the sum of the terms of the harmonic sequence. Notice there's no common ratio between the terms to get from one to one half. We'd have to multiply by a half, but if we multiplied by a half again, we would not get a third. So this is not geometric. So we want to be able to represent, um, to, to be able to distinguish the difference. If n was one, we'd get a times r plus a r squared plus a r cubed 
So the common ratio would be R. They different, different, differ, they differ, sorry, by a product of R each time. Okay, and does this converge or diverge? Well, that's what we're gonna look at next. This is called a geometric series. So convergence of geometric series. Okay, we're going to use the alternate notation for the purpose of convergence of the geometric series because there's a really cool little template that goes along with it if we put it in its alternate form, meaning I'm changing the power on R to N minus one. And bear with me, this is really important. This converges if the absolute value of R is less than one and diverges otherwise. So if the common ratio is one or bigger or negative one or less than negative one, then this is going to diverge. So proof, all right, ready for this? Let's look at a times r to the n minus one. Well, this is if n is one, that becomes the zero power. That's just r to the zero, which is one, it's a, plus a r, and they increase by a factor of r each time. I think this is such a cool little proof. So the nth partial sum is going to be the sum of the first n terms. So this would be the first term, this would be the second term, a r cubed is, oops, a r squared is the third term, a r cubed is the fourth term. So the nth term would be a r to the n minus one. So if I looked at the eighth partial sum, we'd go up to a r to the seventh. If I looked at the 10th partial sum, it would be a plus a r all the way up to a r to the ninth. Now what I'm going to do is just take this nth partial sum and I'm gonna multiply the left and the right side by r. So if I do r times the nth partial sum, then that's just r times a. I'm actually gonna write a times r to keep it looking the same, plus a r squared, plus a r cubed, right? And this time we're gonna go all the way up to I'm going to put this one in right there. So I just, if, if this if in here was a r to the n minus 2, then that would be the corresponding term if I multiplied everything by r. So therefore, if I take the nth partial sum and I subtract r times the nth partial sum, well, what are we going to get? Well, if I take every term in here and subtract every term in here, this guys, these are going to cancel out. Your r squareds are going to cancel out. Your r cubes are going to cancel out. And everything except for the first term and the last term are going to cancel out. It's just going to be a, that constant term, minus a times the common ratio to the nth power. All right, so the nth partial sum, I'm going to factor this out, is equal to, and I'm going to factor the a out here, 1 minus r to the n. So just algebra kids. So the nth partial sum for a geometric series expressed like this to the power n minus one is going to be a times one minus r to the n all over one minus r. So remember, a series converges if it's nth, the, the nth partial sums converge. And what is the limit? as n goes to infinity of s to the n. Well, it's the limit as n goes to infinity of this little algebraic expression that we've created. Right. So now note, the only thing with n on it is this term right here. So the convergence all depends on r to the nth power. And r to the nth power goes to zero only if r is between one and negative one. Otherwise, it diverges. So therefore, 
the limit of the nth partial sum is equal to this limit, a, one minus r to the n over one minus r, which is equal to a over one minus r if and only if r is between one and negative one. So therefore, a r to the n minus one converges to, we can actually find the sum, a over one minus r, if the absolute value of r is less than one, which is equivalent to r being between one and negative one. Right? And the geometric series diverges otherwise. Right, so we can use this as a fact moving forward. So using clever algebra, we can now talk about any geometric series. All right, we already did this guy. Right. This is one half plus one fourth plus one eighth, right? Plus one sixteenth plus. Now in order to use the template, so my common ratio was one half. So therefore we know this converges. Right, but in order to use this template, we have to put it into this form. We need this form. So how do we do that? If n equals one to infinity, one half to the n power. Well, if I take change the power to one half to n minus one, I took a factor of one half away from that, and I'm just gonna stick it out front, because the power here that we don't see is one. So if we add one to n minus one, we get back what we started with. But this is the form we need to have it in in order to use this template. So this is the needed form. So if your power is not n uh, minus one, you take out however many you need to make it n minus one or add how many you need to make it n minus one. So therefore, according to this template, we have a is equal to the constant out front and r is also equal to one half. So this is going to be one half over one minus one half, which is one, which we saw geometrically by looking at the sum of the area and the curves. Practice a couple more of these. Two times one fourth to the n minus one. Well, this is in perfect form. This is geometric series, right? We have a equals two, r equals one fourth. So therefore it converges. And we can actually say what it converges to n equals one to infinity. So if you sat here forever and wrote out the terms of this series and added them up, you would just get a over one minus r. And that's eight thirds. Now we want exact values always, unless otherwise stated. All right, so the next one's a little bit trickier. Can we get this? It looks geometric, right? We see the n, we see n minus one, we see a fraction. Looks geometric. Can we put it into a times r to the n minus one form? Well, let's write this out. The two is the problem, right? So we have two to the n, 6 to the n minus 1. We already have the n minus 1 here, so the 2 is the problem. Now, if you want to reduce the power by 1 on n, just take a factor of 2 out. So this is just 2 times 2 to the n minus 1, all over 6 to the n minus 1. Oops, I lost my sigma, which is sigma. 
2 times 2 to the n minus 1 over 6 to the n minus 1, which is, we're getting there, 2, 2, 6 to the n minus 1, 2 times 1 third to the n minus 1. So there we have a geometric series. A is equal to 2. R is equal to one third. It converges. If we were to sit here and add these numbers up forever, two times one third to the n minus one, and one from one to infinity is two over one minus one third, which would equal three. Again, I tempt you to sit, I tempt you, I challenge you, sit here, add two plus two thirds plus two ninths plus two twenty sevenths for the rest of your life and eventually you will hit three. All right, so that's geometric series. So, so far we know that one over n harmonic series diverges, one over n squared converges, and we know how to tell if a geometric series converges or diverges. So our goal is to learn as much as we can about as many ser series as possible. So theorem, this is a super important one. And it's probably the most simple test that you're going to do. And it's the one that students forget the most. If a series converges, then the limit of its corresponding sequence must be zero. So this is huge. So bear with me. If a series converges, then the limit, oops, sorry. Then the limit, holy Christmas trees. Let's try this one more time. Wow. What am I doing? Then the limit of the corresponding sequence equals zero. In other words, we want to look at the contrapositive of this statement. If the limit of the corresponding sequence does not equal zero, then the series diverges. So it's a required condition, but it's not sufficient, All right? So you're going to look at, when you've given a series, you're gonna look at its corresponding sequence and you're gonna ask yourself, does this sequence converge to zero? If the answer is no, then you don't need to go any farther. The corresponding series will diverge. If the limit equals zero, the test is inconclusive. You have to go further, but at least it can rule out some pretty obvious cases before you even start. So careful, if the sequence goes to zero, the corresponding series may or may not converge. You must investigate further. The test is inconclusive. If a n does not converge to zero, you may conclude the series diverges. So let's look at the series n cubed plus three over two n squared minus five. And let's look at the limit of the corresponding sequence. The limit of this corresponding sequence is infinity because we have a third degree over a second degree. So since the sequence n cubed plus three over two n squared minus five does not converge to zero, we can conclude the series 
n cubed plus 3 over 2n squared minus 5 also diverges. So we didn't even have to go any further. So this is the easiest test for divergence. It does not ever tell us if a series converges or not, but will tell us if it diverges. All right, let's revisit the harmonic series. 1 over n, does this converge or diverge? So the test for divergence. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is equal to 0. The test for divergence, test for divergence, is inconclusive. But we know that this series, 1 over n, diverges. We looked at it earlier by looking and comparing it to the function 1 over x and saw that there's more area under the series 1 over n than there is in the integral of the function 1 over x. All right, so let's use the test for div divergence for this guy. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n squared is 0. Hmm. So our test for divergence is also inconclusive. So we're going to need other tests to test things, but we do know this one. So we know 1 over n squared converges. Right, let's keep going. A couple more theorems. Right. If a, um, and a and b are both convergent, then so uh, is a constant times a series, the sum of those series, and the difference of those series. So if we start with two convergent, series, we multiply every term in the series by the same constant. It's just going to be the constant times the sum of the series. So we can pull a constant out front if it's helpful. If individually the series a n and b n both converge, then the series a n plus b n converges and we can break it up into pieces. So we can split it up and look at them individually. And the same with the difference. If these both converge, converge, we can take the difference. Okay. If either one of these diverges, then we can't make any conclusions about their sums and differences. So recap, the harmonic series, 1 over n is divergent. So we can use this as a fact. The geometric series, when we write it like this, in this form, converges to a over 1 minus r for r between 1 and negative 1. It diverges otherwise. A very useful theorem that can save us a lot of work is the test for divergence. The test for divergence says if a n converges, all convergent series have a corresponding sequence that goes to zero. That is, we take the converse of this, if this limit, oh my goodness, silly me, I wrote that wrong. If this does not go to zero, then the corresponding series diverges. Right, so this is what we're going to use.
because if the limit goes to zero, we can't make any conclusions. But if the limit does not go to zero of the corresponding sequence, we can conclude that that series diverges. All right, have fun with 11-2. See you in 11-3.